We had a good Sunday, didn't we? That was fun. I always like communion Sundays. That was good. We're going to be in Acts 20. <clears throat> Acts 20. And let's start, let's look at verse 21 to start us. Just to read it because I love it. Acts 20, 21. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a great verse. It's a great verse to make sure you understand. Because in that recipe of repentance and faith, I think you see salvation. But people get it really messed up. People get messed up what repentance is. People get messed up what faith is. They get it all messed up. So believe me, I'll promise that we'll get to this verse. We'll study it in length. A lot of our study, time allowing. But let's start at the start of the chapter and read into it in context, okay? Acts 20 and verse 1 as we study through Acts. <clears throat> and after the uproar was ceased, remember that big uproar at Ephesus, the silversmiths and their idolatry. You hurt their bottom line and they're mad at God about it. After the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. When he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, I like that, he's exhorting. We go to the, the Christian life is filled with exhorting and reproving good ex there's a there's a wonderful time for exhorting he came into greece and there abode three months when the jews laid wait for him as he was about to sail into syria he purposed to return through macedonia the jews were laying traps for him they were going to grab him and throw him in jail again if he went on that ship. So instead, it sounds like he went across land again through Macedonia. If you have your maps, you can track along. And so there accompanied him into Asia, Sopater of Berea and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus and Gaius of Derby and Timotheus and of Asia, Tychicus and Trophimus. If I had more time and I had more notes, we might look at some of these men and some of the other places they're mentioned. I just think it's neat. He's going to these places. People are being led to the Lord. Churches are starting, and some of them are joining his missionary team here as they keep going. It's neat. God's calling on everybody is different, but it's all related in that we're all about the sharing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Brings all the body of Christ together as we share the message of reconciliation. We're in Acts chapter 20 now and verse 5. These going before tarried for us at Troas. Now watch verse 6. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. I want you to note the numbers here. And we do repeat ourselves, but sometimes we repeat ourselves because it's good to rehearse what we know and learn doctrine and have that argument ready for when you run into somebody who needs it. Look at the number of days that they are in Troas. How many? Seven days. Now look at verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Just quickly, we've covered it before, but the Sabbath, should we keep the Sabbath today? We've done whole studies on this, and I hope you were there for that, and you got it locked in your head that, no, we're not called to keep the Sabbath anymore. You'll run into Sabbath keepers in the Hebrew Roots Movement, Seventh-day Adventist, who tell you, you we need to meet on Saturday. Saturday is this holy day. We do whole studies on it, but just look right here. If you want one quick argument that says the Sabbath is no longer our, it's not a day of worship, period. Look here. They had seven days in Troas. And when did the disciples decide to break bread, which is communion, and to hold a sermon here by the Apostle Paul? Out of seven days, they chose the first day of the week. The pattern in the New Testament scriptures is this assembling on the first day of the week. That's the time when Christ appeared to his disciples when they were all together in the house. In a deeper study, you could look at it longer, but the Sabbath day was a foreshadowing of Christ to come and a shadowing of resting in Christ, right? Well, Christ came. We don't need to celebrate or to observe the shadow anymore today. We worship on the first day of the week, as did the saints in the New Testament. Okay, just have that in your arguments next time you run into a seven-day Adventist and they start judging you about holy days. 
Watch the end of that verse. Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. So preaching until midnight is scriptural, and we're going to try it tonight, okay? We've got extra coffee downstairs. No, I'm already tired. I'm, I'm already tired. But, Kent, there is your life's verse. Till midnight. He's always saying, we could go longer. I love it. I love it. <clears throat> Eight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they, ga they, they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man, Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. I want to tell you, if any of you have trouble falling asleep during sermons, and it happens. I know it, it, we're all human, okay? If I weren't preaching, I'd probably fall asleep some nights too because I work, I get tired just like you do. But if you're prone to fall asleep, don't sit in the window. This is sound doctrine. This is doctrine 101, okay? Not all the churches are preaching this. We're going to preach this and preach this loud and hard. Just fall asleep right in the pew. Make it look like with your Bible in your hand, if you fall asleep, it looks like you're just deep in study. I don't know. God doesn't know. Nobody knows. <laughs> I, you just like lean on like this and get over like this. And no one knows, right? Okay. But he's in the window. He falls asleep in a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, yeah, this guy's long-winded, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. Terrible. All right, all joking aside, the guy's dead. But isn't, it's kind of interesting to just think of Paul, though, really laboring in a sermon. Isn't that kind of neat to think about? Like, we all, we have these wonderful, inspired scriptures from Paul. And like, whoa, look at that. But I also like to think about Paul as just, he's just, he's just a Christian. He's just human. And he's preaching through a sermon and turning up soil. And apparently a long sermon was needed. But this guy falls down. It was all God's will, and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him and embraced him, said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. Another FYI, if you fall out of the window, I can't come down and, and raise you up again, okay? I've tried it before. It just doesn't work. But Paul went down, fell on him, embraced him, said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. Eleven. When he was therefore was... When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even to day, break of day, so he departed. So the guy does not die. His life's in him. They break bread. They have communion there. And they eat, talk a long while, even till break of day. That was quite a revival night service there. There's liberty, right? God wanted some, some fellowship and some preaching going on there that night. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. 13. <clears throat> Trying to get down to 21 where we're going to jump off a little bit. 13. <clears throat> and he went before to ship, went before to ship and sailed from Asos there intending to take in Paul, for so he had appointed, minded himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Asos, we took him in and came to Mytilene. And we sailed thence and came, and the next day over against Chios, and the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Trogolinium, that's a tough one, Trogolium, and the next day we came to Miletus, for Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus, because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. Remember that map we talked about, his third missionary journey, he wants to get back to Jerusalem. If he gets back to Jerusalem, he's going to become a captive, but that's where he wants to go. God's in it, wants to get back. So he's going to sail back. Let's get to 17. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Here, note verse 17, he's going to call these elders in Ephesus. This shows you a couple of things that elders in churches are biblical. People, overseers in the church. I believe these are people like pastors and deacons. Elders, and they're known of the people, right? I had someone tell me the day there's there's no such thing as leadership in church. It's all just we all just work together and all that. Uh, it doesn't. It's not scriptural. It's also a, a pattern you don't see anywhere in the Bible. There's always leadership. God's in charge in the home. There's leadership. The workplace. There's leadership. And church. There's leadership. He calls the elders together. Look at 18. And when they were come to him. He said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came unto Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind. And with many tears and temptations which befell me by the line and way to the Jews. It's been a great time of preaching and revival, but the whole time he's had a target on his back. The Jews are trying to throw him in prison still. 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house. 
a busy ministry. That doesn't necessarily mean they're having church from house to house. They have central gathering places, but it means he's going and ministering all over from house to house. What is he ministering? What are they talking about? What's the centerpiece of Paul's message and ministry? Look at verse 21. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. If you walked in uh, later, I want to spend some time on that concept. This is the heart of his message, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. We should think of these things, repentance and faith, you should think about them as different things, albeit very, very similar. We should think about them in like the same swing, right? The same sweep. They go hand in hand whenever you see it in Scripture. Repentance toward God, faith toward Jesus Christ. What does it mean? It's a good question to ask because in repentance and faith toward Jesus Christ, you see salvation. I'll say salvation comes about in mankind. So what is it? We'll, we'll define it in some terms, but let's just, let's just start simple. Repentance is a change of mind. We know this in Scripture for many reasons. There are parables that tell us that show repentance is a change of mind. But one of the best uh, reasons we know repentance is a change of mind is that God does it. The scriptures tell us that God repents. This simply means He changes His mind, right? Some people hate to hear that, but it's true. It's in Scripture. He repented and didn't destroy Nineveh and many other like scenarios. What repentance is not, repentance is not penance. Like this work, 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 work. So if Paul's going around, he's not saying you need to do penance to get saved. He's saying you need to change your mind. And it's change your mind toward God. So what would a person need to change their mind toward God about? Whether it be a seven-year-old boy or a 70 year old man, what do they need to change their mind about? With God. It's the fact that they have broken God's laws. You know when a little child comes to salvation, it's when that clicks. It truly is. You can, I don't want to be mean, but you can get a little three, four-year-old who starts learning their words to say, Jesus, be my Savior. You really can. All of us could rush. Hey, my kid just accepted Christ. They, they learned Dada, and then I taught them to say Jesus, and now they're saved. It's, I mean, I don't want to be mean, but you don't want to push your kids into these kinds of things to just say a prayer, okay? Because they need to have repentance, and that is a change of mind. Which for a child, it goes like this. It goes like this. My whole life, my parents love me. Everybody hugged me. I'm everybody's favorite. All right, everybody loves kids, and it's great. We should love kids. Jesus loves it. Stuff for little children coming to me. But it gets a point in a child's life where they realize, I'm not so wonderful. I'm actually a sinner. I've actually broken my Creator's laws. And I'm actually in trouble, right? My parents would do anything for me. They'd buy everything for me. Everybody loves me. But actually, if I died right now, I'd go to hell because I'm a sinner. They changed their mind about who they are as a kid, right? We've seen kids in this church come to the Lord. It's a wonderful thing, but that's it. It's a change of mind. It's a big deal, isn't it? Well, now think about the seven-year-old man. What needs to happen with him? Many times, the exact same thing. As a kid, he thought he was okay. His 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, he still thought he was, his good was outweighing his bad. He's still working pretty good. And though he made some mistakes, he really, overall, he's been a pretty good person. No, he needs to repent, change his mind about who he is and where he's going. That's repentance. That's repentance. Repentance is a change of mind. We've broken God's laws. In fact, we're an abomination in God's sight. In fact, we're an enemy to a holy God. In fact, we're dark, He's light. And in fact, there's no way we could dwell with Him in heaven. Repentance is an acknowledgement of that reality. That's why repentance is very needed today. You understand how this is kind of missing in churches? We'll talk about the faith toward Jesus Christ in a second, but what a lot of churches do, they don't even talk about the change your mind. They just say, just say the prayer, say the prayer. So no one realizes the problem, so they don't truly appreciate the solution, Jesus Christ. And I submit to you, they don't truly call out for the Savior, Jesus Christ. They say a prayer and it's more like, Jesus, help me out, help me do okay, save me from my earthly problems, help me do better, that kind of stuff. 
okay? But when you understand the problem, that you're, you're, you're dead and you're trespassing and sins, you're hell bound, then you look at the Savior as the solution that you need for your immortal soul. Different. That's why the preaching on sin and the preaching on who people are personally is so important. You, throughout Christ's earthly ministry, what do you see? You see him bring people to repentance time and time again. Just think about that woman at the well. He doesn't go, hey, say a prayer about me. He goes right to her sin. Says, he who you now have is not thy husband. Right? She was in the sin of adultery, which is very prevalent today. He got to the point of realizing that she, was, she wasn't good. She was a sinner. And then she was ready to look at Jesus Christ the way he should be looked at as the Savior. Before that, she's just like everybody else. Well, I'm not that bad, and I'll just go find a place to worship. I hear you're supposed to worship in Jerusalem. Is that where I should worship? It's not, that's what the churches are today, right? Well, I hear that, you know, if I want to do better in my Christianity, I'll go worship and stuff like that. No, you need repentance. Then you turn to the Savior, Jesus Christ, in full faith. So repentance toward God. Change your mind about your relationship with God. Although God is love, you will go absolutely to hell if you don't have the Savior. Although God loved the world to send the Savior, that means nothing unless you actually know the Savior. The world actually does a great disservice when we talk, God loves you, 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 God loves you. The church does a disservice if that's all we say, right? That's like saying, um, it more or less is saying, your cancer's okay, your cancer's okay, your cancer's okay. It's not going to be that bad. No, you should say that the cancer's no good and your relationship with God is no good. Yeah, he loved you enough to send a solution, but you don't realize you're at odds with him and your sin. Okay, I'm, I'm digressing, but I'm trying to uh, cultivate our minds and think about this a little bit deeply. Let's think about salvation, faith for salvation. So you got this problem, this problem that needs, repent. you repent, you acknowledge the problem, and then you're primed to turn to Jesus Christ, the reconciler, right? He is that bridge between us and God. He's that one that washes the sins away. Faith in Jesus Christ. So understand that salvation is both things and it's one fell swoop from repentance to I need to trust Christ. You can't go, let's, let's turn to an example. Look at Luke 23, please. Hold a hand here. We'll come back here. You may say, Logan, this is simple. Well, it is simple. It absolutely is simple. But many people get this wrong. And I think a lot of it has to do with the lies planted by the devil and also the pride of mankind. <clears throat> Look at Luke 23. Oh, let's give some proof text, some examples of repentance and faith. Some may say, there are no examples. Oh, there are wonderful examples in Scripture. I'll show you a couple. Look at Luke 23, verse 39. Come here a lot, but it's a great example. A clear-cut example of how does a person get saved. Tell you what, it's repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. 23, 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. That's a man who has not had any repentance. He still thinks he's okay. He wants to keep living his life, right? The bad thief. Remember, we just covered in communion that both of them are railing, but one of them is going to come to repentance here. But the one doesn't see any problem. No repentance. No uh, change of mind about who he is. 40. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou, dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? Oh, what clean, how clean the fear of God is, isn't it? This is a thief. This is a good-for-nothing thief, but on the cross, he finally has true fear of God. And he's finally getting true repentance. And what does it have to do with? His view of God. He fears this God now knowing that he's going to face this judgment. And look at 41, and we indeed justly. For we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. This is a full change of mind for this thief. Who this thief probably came with a lot of baggage. Probably of like, I'm stealing because, you know, I never had much and I never give him much. And I'm entitled to take this. Who knows what chip he had on his shoulder, but he had a chip. But finally here at the end of his life, God gives him an opportunity to look to Christ. And, but he would never look if it weren't for repentance. 
would never look if it wasn't for this change of mind about who exactly he is and where he stands with God. Look at 42. And he, he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Look at that. That is repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He's got it figured out now, the big problem he has. He's guilty in his sins. And what comes right next? Lord, save me. Lord, save me. You get how it's all just one fell swoop from repentance to salvation? But you got to have both. You got to have both. If he just stops at verse 40 and 41 and says, Well, I changed my mind. I repent. I'm just worthless. I'm worthless. I'm worthless. I'm guilty. But he doesn't ask Christ to save him. Does he go to heaven? No. No. Or how about this? In 42, he just has this conversation. Uh, you know, Jesus, we're on the same page. Love you. He's a good guy. I'm with Jesus. Right? Testify. Praise God. But he doesn't call out for the Savior, the solution to fix this problem. Right? That kind of faith isn't saving faith. That's the kind of faith that you talk, you knock on people's doors and they're like, well, are you a Christian? And yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, okay, well, great. Well, why, if you die today, why would you go to heaven? And they'll say things like, well, you know, I've just always been in the church. My parents were in the church and I was, I was in the church and just kind of always, always been a Christian. Ain't no such thing as always been a Christian. No, that's a person who just knows the name, but Christ doesn't know their name. What I'm saying is, true repentance brings a true understanding of Jesus Christ. You gotta have both, right? And you call out in true faith for that Savior once you know why you need Him. False professions in our world exist because there's not true repentance, and then false professions exist because, look at verse 42 and what 43 teach. He says, Remember me when thou comest to thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, If thou shalt be baptized, thou shalt be with me in paradise. If thou shalt be baptized in water, you'll make it. So the thief, he wrestles himself off that cross and he goes dips himself in the Mormon water or the Catholic water or some kind of water and boom, he's in. No? No, what Jesus actually says, If... Thou shalt live a good life. This guy didn't live a good life. His life was over at this point. He didn't earn anything. Why is he in heaven today? Because he asked Christ to be his Savior. You cannot say faith plus works is faith. It's not. Many people say this. They get it wrong on the faith side, right? So people get the repentance wrong. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm belabored, I understand. But some people say there's no such thing as repentance today. They're, they're teaching people a false gospel. Some people say repentance is works. That's false too. On the faith side, some people say, well, you're not just saved by faith. You've got to add to it. That's not faith either. In this whole equation, in repentance and faith, I think you see every false gospel in the whole world. How about not faith in your works, but how about faith towards something else? Well, this guy really believes in, in Buddha or some other god. No, faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. The only way, the truth, and the life. Let me show you one more example. Look at Acts 16. You, you gotta, you, you've got to preach this soundly, understand it soundly, because there are ditches on all kinds of sides in this topic. I have people um, now who I'm meeting who are really big on repentance is a work. Repentance is a work. Right, you've got, that means you've got to not just change your mind, but you've got to go live a clean life and, and stop making all kinds of mistakes. They're convoluting it. The true answer is once you get saved, you're going to want to, and the Holy Spirit's going to compel you, and the Father's going to compel you as chastisement to live a good life. You'll never be perfect, but you'll strive for perfection. You'll strive for perfection, but you won't be perfect, right? But the repentance people say, this means you've got to change all your ways, and then you'll earn your way into heaven. Because they, they view repentance as a work. It's not true. The thief on the cross, did he work his way into heaven in any way, shape, or form? Nope. He repented in his heart about who he was. Look at another example. Look at Luke's, or, excuse me, Acts 16, 27. We read this one before too. Please understand this topic though. And if, you, if you're not sure about your own salvation, maybe you've been uh, confused about these topics. I'm trying to be clear tonight. 
Look at Acts 16.7. Now, I'm trying to be clear because the scriptures are clear. 16.27. And the keeper of the prison. This is the Philippian jailer. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. It doesn't say the word repentance here anywhere, but you can see it in his heart. This, this proud, successful jailer who was on top of Paul, now he's groveling at his feet, watched his question and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He's changed his mind about himself from being on top of the world and now I need saved out of this sinful state that I'm in. My soul needs a redeemer. I need the solution. He understands the problem, doesn't he? Salvation. Salvation. Churches must preach the fear of the Lord. Watch this guy. He came with fear and trembling. People must fear God again. God shook the whole prison and the guy started waking up. God shakes people's lives today and it seems like people still don't wake up he shakes people's health and their home and their finances but still no fear of God the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and that's both for how you live your life it's also for salvation it's a starting point you know when a kid starts getting it we talked about kids repent they change their mind about themselves so I'm not I'm not little Johnny precious I'm a sinner and they also change their mind and they get this healthy fear of consequences for actions there is hell because of sin. <laughs> it's no marvel why our world today, few are truly coming to the Lord. It's no marvel, is it? We're not teaching consequences for actions. Don't teach that. You know, don't lead by fear. You're a fear monger. There's that whole kind of, well, you better fear God and hell. Don't fear man, you better fear that. But that's, that's, a, that's against our culture today. And there's also against the idea of Consequences for actions, you know, capital punishment, spanking is, is that's just terrible. Just do positive reinforcement. I'm sorry, God's not a positive reinforcement God. He's not going to positive reinforce you, reject Him your whole life. There's no positive reinforcement there. And then the faith side has been destroyed with so much humanism that we people think we can achieve holiness through our sinful flesh. Boy, the odds are stacked, these, stacked against these generations, aren't they? It takes a, a, a healthy view of Scripture to wake up these hearts, a good church to preach away these lies. Okay. He says, what must I do to be saved? 31. And they said, go be baptized. Go do some work. Try your hardest. Mend your ways. No. For salvation, they say, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto the and they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. I like that. They, they tell him the answer, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house, which means your house can do the same thing, believe as well. But I don't think he actually accepted Christ then. Because it, look, it says, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in the house. They go, they continue to preach. It leads me to believe that, and I know you wouldn't do this, but forcing someone to say a quick prayer. Baptists do it all the time. So you've got, someone, you've got someone's attention, go ahead and have them say a prayer. I don't know. I'm going to make sure someone actually understands repentance, and understands what salvation is. I think they go back to the house here and they share in, in detail the Word of God. 33, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straight way. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. They were believers. They became believers. They were baptized. They enjoyed a time of fellowship there in the house. It's another example of repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, let's go back to our text. On the topic of repentance and faith, are there any questions? Any questions? Repentance is that view of God and His laws and how we've gone wrong. Faith toward Jesus Christ is that solution sent by God to fix the problem. Let's go back to our text. Acts chapter 20 and verse 
Where are we at now? 22? 22. Paul says, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Paul doesn't know what's going to happen, but God knows perfectly what's going to happen. For God's glory and for the mission of the gospel, he's going to be made captive there and sent to Rome. He's ready to go, though. The Spirit's guiding him. Look at 23. Say that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Holy Spirit's telling them that the gospel's got to go to every city. 24. But none of these things move me. He's got some indication that there's going to be some trouble up ahead. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Isn't 24 a good verse, friends? That line that says, neither count I my life dear, isn't that like a cornerstone of Christianity altogether? You will never be the kind of witness or anywhere near the kind of witness Paul was if you count your life dear. Now, this is my life. It's the only one I got. You've got to live it up. You've got to live it for myself. got to make it the best I can for myself. It's all about myself. You're going to live a miserable, pointless, unspiritually productive life. Because when you find your life, you lose it. You lose your life for my sake and the gospel. It's the same to save it. Paul says, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. I think it comes full circle. If you want to run this race with joy, you've got to stop running your own race, right? Get on track with God's race for your life, who you're living for, why you're living, and you'll find a joyful race. Even through some of the hard times that Paul's going to go through, you'll find the joy in the race. I think when the Christian is most miserable is when we... No, we're supposed to live for the Lord. The Spirit tells us that. God's Word tells us that. We know that. But we live not that way. Right? And we, then we ask, why, am I, why aren't I finding the joy? Where's the joy in this whole thing? You, you know why. Paul can find joy in the prison cell. And we can find joy in this life no matter where we are. 25. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. He's got heavy indication that he won't be back by this way. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. What if your time was running out? Sometimes I think these thoughts, and they're not the happiest thoughts, but what if God called you as a person who didn't get 70, 80, 90 years? We're all not guaranteed that, you know that? In this room, it's, it sounds macabre to think about, but in this very room, there may be some people who don't see another decade. Maybe younger people in this room. It's, it's very true. I, I told you on, Wednesday, on Sunday night that we're all living on borrowed time. Sometimes God calls people home early. Stefan had an early exit from the race, didn't he? Well, would that be true of you? Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. He's talking about that Ezekiel concept of warning the wicked, of people that God brings into your life. And you know that you are the ambassador sent for that person. Think about this too, by the way. Who's got a ton of saved relatives? Who has a ton of saved friends? Who, who has a ton of saved neighbors? I don't know if any of us do. That means you're probably the ambassador to the family. You're probably the ambassador to the neighborhood, the ambassador to the friendship circle. That means the blood's on your hands, your job, right? Could you say, like he says, I'm pure from the blood of all men, 27, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God? And you know, and Paul said, you know what he's saying? So I didn't just talk about the smooth things. I covered everything. All the counsel means that Paul sat down with people and had some of the tough discussions. All right, like this, this is sin. This is idolatry, right? This is sin in your church. Some of the tough discussions. He said that was free from the blood of all men. And why? I think it comes right back to the principle of repentance. He had those hard discussions because some people needed to view their sin as sin. Yeah, if I didn't come all the way at the end of that thought, think about that. If you don't change your mind about your entire life, it's not true repentance. 
What if someone says, like today you have homosexuals profess Christ. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm living with another man, but I asked Christ to save me. Well, there was no repentance of sin there, was there? There wasn't a change of mind about sin. And it's not just that sin or any kind of sin. You hold sins out of your repentance, it's not repentance. Let's say that you, you have other, uh, other sins. Idolatry. Well, I changed my mind about a lot of what I am, but I'm not going to give away my rosary beads. I'm not going to give away my little statue to Mary. I'm keeping those things. So I'm going to repent of other things I might have done wrong, but I don't repent of those, and then I ask Christ to save me. It's not true repentance. If you're holding sin back, you're saying, these sins don't need taken care of. That's why we're diligent, aren't we? When we go with people and say, no, no that's, that's sin and all that's sin. That's why in scriptures you see prayers like, um, forgive me for the sins that I'm not even aware of. When you ask Christ to save you, you better come fully broken, fully repentant of the sin in your life, not holding sins back. So Paul preaches the full counsel of God to bring people to repentance, to point them to the Savior, Jesus Christ. Could that be said in your life? Especially if you had to leave today. Do your, your relatives know the Savior? 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock. He's really telling to these church leaders, right? He's got these elders from Ephesus there. And he's saying, have you been doing your job? So I think in especially pastors, teachers need to do their job in this area. There will be a lot of pastors with blood on their hands. We talked about that on Sunday. To all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Yeah, in churches, they talk a lot about feeding, feeding, feeding. And it's scriptural, but use the full counsel of God as well. Christ purchased with his own blood. 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. See some wolves today. 30. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Of course, the devil's tactic is going to be raised up tares among the wheat, and Paul says it's going to happen among these people. Among you guys right here, there's going to be some people who, who start saying perverse things just to draw away a crowd of their own. In this chapter, you see the whole spiritual battle, don't you? See the whole spiritual battle. I hope you can see yourself on these pages, though, as someone who's repented, trusted Christ, and now you're a witness to this gospel. 30. Also of your own self, shall men, no, 31. Therefore watch and remember... That by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. I think if Paul the Apostle were here, you'd, you'd be tempted to say, just calm down, you're over the top, you're too stressed out, you're too worried. But Paul was worried about souls. And he had enough spiritual eyesight to see, well, there's a lie popping up here, there's a wolf over here, another you know, perverse saying over here. It's in your house, too. I mean, trust God, have joy in your life, but still understand that the battle is still raging. 32, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. We covered that before. 35. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. I did that whole lesson on tent building and starting churches. Right, we talked about it's okay. In fact, it's what Paul did as ministers to labor. Well, who's he talking to here again? the elders at Ephesus. He's telling them it's okay for you guys to work. So it's definitely okay. I stand as a man tonight who's tired from my earthly toil, <laughs> but I thank God for what he's given. Such a wonderful opportunity here at Truth Baptist Church. We, we all could have sat around and waited for some full-time gig somewhere, right? No, we should be full-time for Christ right now, every last one of us. Leading our families, our friends, Neighbors, pointing them to Jesus Christ. 36. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. I love it. 
There's bended knee. Praying together. The church with the brethren. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. There's that greet one another with a brotherly kiss, right? I don't know why you guys don't want to do that. What's the deal? The culture kind of ruined that one, didn't it? <laughs> we'll just do it handshakes, I guess. Back then it was normal. It wasn't so defiled, the idea. 38. Sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. Last time they're going to see Paul. Sorrow. They part ways. Some true love there. I think love knit together by the gospel and by the work of the ministry. Yeah. You'll, we talked about it before, but you want to grow close to somebody, your spouse, a brother, sister, a church, labor around the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think your heart should be knit together like Jonathan and David. I think, I think you will find this true fellowship when we serve the Lord together. That's chapter 20. The point of emphasis was the repentance uh, toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Any questions from that chapter? Everybody doing their part to share the gospel? Cannot shun. We cannot fail to do that with the time God gives us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to live this life. Lord, the wonderful salvation given to us in the face of Jesus Christ. We thank you for that, Lord. Help us to understand sound doctrine, what repentance is. Help us to be able to preach the message of repentance, that people need to change their mind about who they are. And then, Lord, that they would look toward Jesus Christ and view him as he ought to be viewed, the perfect lamb, the perfect redemption for their soul, because, Lord, he paid for it with his perfect blood at Calvary. Thank you for what we have, Lord, our opportunity today to serve. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.